Hey everyone! Today I'd like to invite you to take a trip towards the Pacific with James Cook. So we're at the end of the 18th century here and there was during a time when the South Seas were still somewhat unknown to Europeans and James Cook was sent out to explore the area and to find the mysterious southern continent that people thought would have to be there to sort of balance out the land masses. James Cook went on three journeys, once from 1768 to 71 then from 72 to 75 and the third journey was from 76 to uh, 1780 when the ships came back to England so without James Cook James Cook isn't always an easy figure to talk about. Um, here we have an older painting of James Cook landing in Botany Bay in 1770 with the British flag behind him, sort of victoriously claiming the land. But today in Australia you also have um, more critical voices like this one here where the Union Jack is shown with a skull on top of it and the painting is called we call them pirates out here because of course for many people around the world James Cook arrival meant that a lot of things were about to change and it wasn't necessarily James Cook himself that brought about this change but um, of course there was the, the British Empire that followed the European interests in creating wealth for themselves and finding colonies. There was of course also a scientific interest. There was on principle an interest in building friendship with the people that they met but I guess um, political interests and uh, economic interests sometimes weigh a little more greatly than that but I think that's not our topic for today we want to have a look at the actual course that James Cook took and I really like these maps that we have in this book here. So let's see, let's start with the first journey. We set off in Plymouth in England and go to Madeira. From there along the African coast across the Atlantic towards Rio de Janeiro which was ruled by the Portuguese and interestingly um, the British were not allowed to go on land they were allowed to uh, take provisions but it was all supervised by uh, I think the military because of course uh, the Portuguese assumed that it wasn't a purely scientific journey that James Cook was on Officially, James Cook was told to observe the Venus transit, that is, um, the Venus passing in front of the Sun. And the idea was if you can observe that from different parts of the Earth, you can get an idea how far away Venus and the Sun are from the Earth. And it was actually quite an accurate uh, estimation, I think it was only off by 3%. And while well, officially James Cook was on a journey to observe the Venus transit from the southern hemisphere. And this is actually what he did. 
for the first part. So we're here in 1769 in the south and we're going to Tahiti and this is where the first part of the journey was completed. Uh, James Cook did observe the Venus transit and then opened a second set of sealed orders and those sealed orders told him to explore the Pacific and look for this mysterious southern continent. Now, James Cook wasn't alone uh, when he sailed from Tahiti. They took someone on board called Tupaya. He was a priest from uh, originally Ra'iatea. I hope I'm saying this correctly. And he had a lot of knowledge of this area, of course. So, here for example, we are having a map of the Pacific Islands and this was probably created by combining Tupaya's knowledge of the area, of the different islands, their names, how to find them and the logic of European cartography. Uh, James Cook was a really good cartographer and uh, that's what he was originally known for. So together they worked out how to create this map. It's possible that there are some translation errors in there. Um, of course, for James Cook it meant that he would have to swap north and south. And it's possible that sometimes he got it wrong, so it is... Um, some people guess that maybe some of the islands are placed on the wrong side of the map. Of course, the names are transliterations of their actual Pacific names. But all in all, I think this is a really amazing map. And um, I think that a lot of work probably went into it and a lot of translation and working together between two people from vastly different backgrounds. Tupaya was generally of uh, amazing help for the um, journey. We see here that he created plenty of drawings of the people that they met. Here, for example, we have some musicians with drums and flutes. We have a dancer here. And many other drawings that we're going to come across later. He was also extremely important once James Cook got to New Zealand. Let's have a look at the course. So they sailed from Tahiti. Here's a, a little loop here. Another one here. And then we're getting to New Zealand. And the South Island. Before eventually setting off to Australia. Now the interesting thing is here that the people of New Zealand were able to understand Tupaya because these are related languages that are spoken here. And um, when you look at the uh, stories that are told of the initial encounters between James Cook's crew and the Maori of New Zealand, uh, they, there was a lot of conflict. It wasn't an easy encounter. And um, my impression is that without Tupaya, this would have been, uh, you know, even more difficult and uh, even more tragic, probably. But as it was, Tupaya was really popular. Uh, he 
manage to communicate really well, to negotiate with everyone. And he became quite beloved in New Zealand. When James Cook came back later, uh, people were chanting to Paya's name. But unfortunately, he wasn't there on the second journey. We also have plenty of drawings from the scientists on board. This one's by Sidney Parkinson, of a New Zealand man. This was probably a demonstration of a canoe going to war. Here's another one of Tupaya's drawings of uh, Banks. He was one of the uh, crew members and a Maori man exchanging gifts. And you can see that they were uh, holding on to the gifts quite firmly. So he's holding on to, this might have been a bit of fabric, he's holding on to it while already reaching for the, uh, I think that's a lobster. So there was a certain level of distrust here, you know. People didn't know each other, they weren't sure whether they could actually trust each other. And this is quite amazing. This is Tiharita. He was a young boy when James Cook uh, came ashore. And uh, later in 1852, he told of his encounter and it was written down. And he said, it was quite strange when the boat came towards the land the people on it were backwards. They were rowing with their back towards the, the, the land. So they thought that they were uh, evil trolls with their eyes and the backs of their heads. So something so small can really have big consequences. Observing something that you can't really make sense of at first because the boats were unknown and the technique was unknown to them already. another beautiful portrait and I quickly want to jump to the different book so this one's actually a catalogue from an exhibition from about 10 years ago and uh, one of the interesting things so this is the portrait that we saw earlier and this pendant here that we're seeing around the man's neck is probably one of these two and you can see it today in museums in Europe or at least it's of the same style This one here is in the Pitt Rivers Museum, the University of Oxford, 196. This is um, it was a present from James Cook to King George III, so it doesn't say how James Cook got it, and it's today part of the royal collection of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II in London. New Zealand all in all was quite successful. Eventually Cook continued on towards Australia. Now Australia at the time was still unknown. Um, the Europeans know bits and pieces of it but uh, James Cook I think was the first one to map the entire 
eastern coastline all the way up here to Torres Strait and we have what is Sydney today which at the time was called Botany Bay we have somewhere along the route here a place called uh, 1770 because Cook went ashore there in 1770 which I think is really interesting and uh, we have the Great Barrier Reef where the uh, ship ran aground and had to be repaired for seven weeks and then here in this area near the Torres Strait we have an island called Possession Island where Cook went um, ashore again and declared that the entire region belonged to the English crown from now on he then continued onwards towards New Guinea here we have the Philippines he went to uh, today Jakarta, Batavia where Tupai unfortunately passed away from a fever and then in 1771 through the Indian Ocean he went once around the world around the Cape of Good Hope towards St. Helena northwards through the Atlantic and eventually back to Plymouth James Cook uh, brought back a number of maps here we have the chart of New Zealand and he tried to transcribe the uh, native names of the North and South Island it was a little bit off, but he tried. You can also see the exact course. I can see here with some detours. Uh, here you can see that the map isn't fully filled in because they had to leave the coastline and couldn't observe it properly. There was a few bits and pieces where they weren't sure, for example here in the south um, This bit here is shown as a peninsula But it turns out it's actually an island, it's not connected to the main island But all in all, these charts were very very accurate Here we have some of the notes on Botany Bay in this case Some more of Tobias drawing An exact chart of Botany Bay, where Sydney is located today and a drawing of the people they met um, communication with the native people of Australia was a little more difficult because they don't speak a Polynesian language it's not related to the language of um, Tahiti or New Zealand so Tupaya was uh, a little lost <laughs> so there there wasn't quite as successful communication attempt and finally I noticed this was a flower I used to have on my balcony I had no idea it was from Australia it's pretty neat all right so that was the first voyage now James Cook came back with a lot of information but um, people were still wondering about that southern continent. You can
can see here that the islands are filled in you have plenty of islands in this area here you have uh, Nouvelle Zealand, New Zealand but uh, Nouvelle Holland, New Holland or Australia is only partly filled in still a good deal missing and there were still people who thought that there had to be an entire continent because of course what Europeans had observed with the Americas is that the northern continent and the southern continent seemed to be in balance so they figured since you have this large landmass of Asia in the northern hemisphere there would have to be something similar down here in the south and James Cook was asked to go on another journey and see if he could find that landmass. Now, let's see where that took him because this one went a little differently. He started off in 1772 again in Plymouth on a different ship this time. The first one was the Asian Park Endeavour. This was the HMS Resolution. There were two ships. He was accompanied by the HMS Adventure by Captain Fumo. And they went south towards Madeira, Cap Verde, the African coast. They crossed the Atlantic, but then had to turn back towards. Uh, Cape Town and then set off again and this time they went south very 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 far south here in January 1773 And we're going once around the uh, Antarctic continent. Eventually to New Zealand. Queen Charlotte Sound. Now, from here we take it first to Red Line. In July 1773. Charting some more of these maps here, going back to Tahiti and back to New Zealand. Then, half a year later, we're taking this golden line here, crossing the Antarctic Circle. twice before turning north towards the Easter Islands coming close to the equator here to Samoa Fiji, Tana near Caledonia Norfolk Islands and back to Queen Charlotte Sound and now, finally, in November 1774, we're staying north of the Antarctic Circle. Going here, all the way back towards the Atlantic Ocean. We're in 1775, coming up to Cape Town, to St. Helena. Us in the South American coast and returning to Plymouth past the Azores. So this was a three year journey with two ships which I think was pretty hard on the crew considering how far south they went. Um, they probably set off thinking that they would see all these different beautiful islands again. But when we look at the drawings that they brought, 
it doesn't look quite as comfortable you have a lot of ice here so far south you can see how small the ships look in comparison interestingly at the time uh, people weren't quite sure how and why water was, re was reacting in a specific way when it was getting cold so they thought that maybe the cold was an actual entity that got into the water and caused it to expand so it's uh, I think always interesting to see the the things that we know were at the time still up for debate the weather was quite stormy too so the crew really had a hard time on board of the ships and occasionally it got so windy and eventually uh, foggy too that they lost sight of each other was the idea of the southern continent this was the European idea of what it should look like I guess with another landmass over here But James Cook eventually realized that there couldn't be a landmass there. Uh, he charted so much of the Pacific Ocean, he would have found it if it had been there. So eventually he went back to the islands that he already knew. met some more very cool looking people this is uh, Tu or Utu he was the uh, king of Tahiti at the time when he went back and they brought uh, some more people on board like Hitihiti who looks incredibly young here he came aboard the Resolution in 1773 and joined them going to Tonga, New Zealand, Antarctica and the Easter Islands and when he returned to Tahiti he... Um, I'm not sure if he actually expressed the wish to stay on the island or whether he had to be convinced um, I think he had to be convinced quite firmly to stay behind and it says here that once he left the resolution he turned back a gaze of unspeakable torment and started crying so I guess he probably wanted to see more of the world and maybe go to England like some other people from the island there was another person on board who did go to England with James Cook and became quite well known and there was this person here his name was Mai or Omai and he spent two years in England and was the darling of the high society um, he was quite popular I think in England however it was decided that he would go back to Tahiti and that eventually was the official reason for James Cook's third journey so taking Omai back home here we have it
the third journey again around the world. We're starting off in Plymouth again with two ships, the Resolution and the HMS Discovery, along the African coast, across the Pacific, back towards uh, Cape Town, and then going south past Prince Edward Islands, around Antarctica without crossing the Antarctic Circle towards Tasmania and Queen Charlotte Sound in New Zealand which at that point was already quite well known towards the Tonga Islands and the Cook Islands to Tahiti where Omai then stayed behind. There's quite a dramatic picture of his return. Here he is shown arriving on horseback like a medieval knight firing a pistol with James Cook accompanying him and people fleeing from this impressive warrior. It probably wasn't quite like that. He says here it's, there's a lot of fantasy in this drawing. And um, what I'm getting from the story here is that the return wasn't quite that easy. Um, he got a house, he also got some servants, he had horses and all kinds of um, other animals and Cook announced that he will come back and if Omai wasn't there anymore if the house should be left alone then he would take revenge so I guess it was his uh, attempt to make sure that Omai was protected And Cook then moved on towards Hawaii. So we're here in Tahiti, going north to Hawaii. Then let's see which way around are we going. Like this, towards the North American coast. North towards Anchorage. There was very bad weather here. Around Alaska. And into the Bering Strait. And this time Cook meant to find the Northwest Passage. So the passage around the north of uh, the American continent. However, as you can guess, he was blocked off by the ice here and had to return along the Siberian coastline. He then returned to Hawaii and it, said that he, it is said that he was uh, quite frustrated on this leg of the journey probably also feeling quite under the weather and in Hawaii um, he then passed away when he got into a conflict with the uh, native people here. Now the thing with James Cook is that from his very first journey from him when he was here the very first time uh, one of his strategies was to take hostages. For example, at one point um, some items got stolen from his ship or they disappeared from his ship and uh, he took some hostages until they were returned. And that's a strategy he employed um, throughout his entire journey. Which is also what he did here in Hawaii. 
and uh, unfortunately this time it didn't go very well a fight broke out and uh, he passed away well initially uh, he got the burying rights in Hawaii he got burying rights normally reserved for um, chiefs or captains or people of quite a high social prestige um, some of his remains were returned to the crew later and he got a burial at sea too the ships later continued north again past Japan Macau towards Batavia and then Discovery returned under John Gore past Cape Town north through the Atlantic towards Europe So the encounter in Hawaii was a little bit difficult, but nonetheless, we do have plenty of um, objects that came back to Europe with the uh, ships of James Cook. For example, this feather gourd here, it's made of uh, different parts of plants feathers, nuts, these are teeth from a dog and it's said that this was in Captain Cook's cabin while he was writing his logbook entries and today it's placed in Vienna in one of the museums in the Hofburg and of course all of these objects are very very fragile since they're made of organic material and the colors have probably faded quite a lot since then so like I said, James Cook's legacy isn't always an easy one but it's definitely quite impressive to see what the globe looked like before his expeditions and how much of it was filled in afterwards we have here the Australian coastline that really doesn't look they're different from today and this is from 1783 so just after Cook's journeys alright, I will link the names of these two books in the description I don't know if this one is available in English since it's a catalog for a, um, an exhibition that was in Germany, in Austria and in Switzerland but I know that the other one is available in English so you can look that one up if you're interested Alright, so with that So with that, I say thank you for watching and I'll see you again next time.